Uh, well, it's lovely to be here, and I'm thrilled to be here with Carty. Um, I had the pleasure this morning of going and seeing the show as it's being installed at Sadie Coles, uh, and I thought maybe it's just good to give a little bit of context about uh, how that show is being organised. So those of you who know Sadie Coles on Kingley Street will know it's a kind of massive gallery upstairs into which has been built this extraordinary hexagonal structure. You walk in the square room and then you walk into this hexagon. On each of the sides of the hexagon is one of these monumental paintings. It's a cycle of six. Carty has taken a degree of inspiration from uh, a symphony by Mahler, his eighth symphony, I think. I think it's not really a symphony. It's not a symphony. Yeah. A song cycle? A song cycle. Song cycle, uh, which is also in six parts. So each of these monumental paintings relates to one part of uh, that song cycle. And maybe we can just begin there, actually, and how you yeah. came across Mahler and why you thought it would be appropriate for your work or what, uh, what you liked about it. Um. I think it came from discussing with a, with a mus musician friend of mine. And he was telling me that as a, because, yeah, no, we have to start different. My last show at uh, Tim van Laar in Antwerp, I based loosely around another song of Mahler, which is um, Der Welt abhanden. Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen, which means you lose connection with Earth or reality or something. And um, I thought back then, that I experience this feeling as an artist quite often that you you work so hard and you're so much in your own little universe that you that you can't really face Regent Street anymore. <laughs> so you're very much in your own reality, so that you're uh, apart from the world, like the song says. So um, I did that show, and then I discussed Mahler with a friend of mine who rents the music studio under my my painting studio. And uh, he told me that as a child he, he was conducting on a chair this Lied van der Erde, which is uh, the song which is now about. And I became quite fascinated by the lyrics of it because they are so describing. Uh, you can see already, I, I could see the paintings already finished. And um, somehow, yeah, then I listened to the songs and it got me interested in doing this. Circle. Well, perhaps we can see the first painting in the cycle. And so this is called, uh, what's it? I'm going to say the English and not the German. Oh, yeah. So English. drinking songs from the sorrows of the earth. Yeah. And perhaps you can just describe about, you mentioned your friend who's this character here in the Yeah, painting. he's in fact the... Wonsie. The, 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 <laughs> the Wonsie guy is the, yeah, the guy who discussed the, the music piece. So Marlowe, when he was working on this song cycle, used six poems from the Tang Dynasty, six Chinese yeah. poems which are recently translated into German. So there's these six poems at the heart of it. This one is the drinking song from the sorrows of the earth. And then you've updated it or translated it into a very specific Antwerp context. Yeah. So perhaps you could just tell us about this bar and about the various figures that you're presenting in the painting. Oh, well, yeah. um, maybe because of I'm not such a good social figure, so I always use my friends or family members for, to pose for the pictures. So this, mostly I invite them to the place where we want to take the photo, where I want to paint them later. So here I chose a bar, which is a well-known Antwerp bar, the cat. And actually the bar lady, which you see in the back, is also the bar lady of the bar, um, Susie. And the rest, they are musicians, so, and, uh, and friends. The girl is a friend. She returns in many of my paintings. She also cut the movie, which you're going to see at St. Paul's, and she stars in the movie. Everything is always kind of connected somehow. Um, yeah, and so when I was painting it, I was thinking it's almost like a modern altar piece, you know, at a bar. You have this priest kind of, uh, yeah, it's like the modern. So we have this like conducting effectively, is yeah, that right? Really, yeah. kind of, and these are his musicians. These are his musicians, yeah. And am I right in saying these the actual musicians who will play? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna make a musical performance at the 19th of December and they play the, the last song of the song cycle. Uh -huh. And in the top right hand corner we can just see a little inscription which says, Dunkel ist das Leben ist der Tod. Yeah. Which is dark is dark is life, dark is death, is that yeah. right? Yes. It's a bit of negative yeah, <laughs> it's so dramatic. But I wanted to use it. It's a very famous 
saying in Germany, somehow people know it all. And um, yeah, I think Bala, when he wrote those, uh, this song cycle, he had these horrible, horrible experiences in his life. I think his daughter died. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it was at the end of his life when he wrote this. Something. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, just a little context on what Marla was writing from, I think, as you say, his daughter had died, he'd suffered some other kind of grief, yeah. I think he'd been very ill. Yeah, he so was he was composing sick. this, or he was looking for a structure to write something and casting around, and came across these Chinese poems which had recently been translated. So there's an interesting thing which I think we could bear in mind as we're talking through it, that Marla was going back to you know, a completely different context, a completely different era, for inspiration was then translating it, or using it for his own compositions, and it's interesting to me, anyway, that you are now revisiting that and yeah. addressing the themes which both Marla and the poems originally dealt with. So this is called Drinking Song for the sorrows of the, from the Sorrows of the Earth. It's this idea of revelry or drunkenness or celebration. Yeah, I think what's, what's amazing to me is that such, such old poems from 600 uh, after Christ, God, <laughs> um, <laughs> Can can still be yeah can be so universal that they're in fact very uh, contemporary mm. problems. And can we just talk about the practicalities of how you actually organised it? So you took all of, is that is yeah, everyone here was in the bar. The yeah yeah it feels better. I mean sometimes uh, if it, if it doesn't work out you you need to take a photo at a different location and mm. uh, put puzzle that in later. Uh -huh. But um, yeah it's more most. Mostly I do it like this, that I invite the people there, we take a photograph and then I, I take photographs of the details because I, for painting, if you see it now so little, I mean it's life size the people, so it's really huge and I like to see all the details and the hands and if you, if you see the, mm. how the reflection of the colors on the skin and stuff, so. I mean, are you thinking at that stage about how they're lit, or is that something that you're then working yes, on? Yes, I, yeah. I take lighting with me. So you took lighting with yeah. you, you presented them. I mean, you're kind of moving them around the space, choreographing Yeah, you always have a bit of a plan, but then you have to rearrange, because some people are not able to do this, or yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I know a composition <laughs> doesn't work out or something. So it's a rough plan, and then you see how it goes. And yeah, we should bear in mind that all of these works, when <coughs> you look at the, the six, are three and a half metres by this two is and a half metres? Yeah. That's so they're almost the width of the screen, I guess, which gives you a little bit of... Yeah, maybe not, maybe not as high. Yeah, pretty, pretty big one, this one, yeah. So maybe we can move on to the next. And this is Alone in Autumn. Alone in Autumn. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I wanted him to be really alone, so <laughs> very, very isolated. So I put the two panels next to him, so to keep him more away from all yeah. the other paintings. And this... It's actually an English, English artist, Michael Curran, and he, he visited me in Antwerp and we went to the sculpture museum where there's a sculpture graveyard and I always think it's something so sad about sculpture <coughs> resting for the next move to somewhere. So that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the sculptures. And it's interesting you chose these three panels as well. You talked about the idea of keeping him alone, or kind of yeah. separating him. Yeah, separate. But also it conjures the altar, the altar piece as well, yeah. in three pieces. Yeah, you can close him up even Exactly, more. yeah, yes. yeah. But it, and it relating a little bit to the previous work we saw, yeah. which had that kind of sense of an altar, or the place. Yeah, and there you also, I even didn't think about it, but it happened automatically that I, I took the same colors on the sides and made these kind of doors. Okay. Yeah, yeah, think about it. So it's kind oh, of see, really yeah. coming back. So. Oh, so actually, which I admit, you do have that sense. Yeah. So you have these two panel doors yes. in the corner. It changes it. Into, into... Is it a conscious thing yeah. that you're making these kind of pieces, which, I mean, is maybe <laughs> an annoying thing for someone in London to say, but you're based in Antwerp, which yeah. has this extraordinary history of painting and altar pieces as well. Yeah. Is that something you're thinking about? Are you conscious of that? Or is it just something that... I think it's more fits? unconscious that, it, yeah. that those things happen. I mean... You can't, there's lots of background, of, of course. I mean, in the school where I studied, it was very traditional. We didn't, I don't know if you have to do it, I hope not, but we had to, we had to go to the Fi Museum of Fine Arts and we have to copy, we had to copy all, uh, like, a, like a painting we wanted, yeah. so some Christ or... Yeah, I took, a I took a monk, uh -huh. 
Okay. And he one day he was just gone, so I luckily <laughs> could stop this. <laughs> but your copy will survive in history. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, we just tend to, to talk a little bit about the kind of the blank space and the, the yeah, yeah. The empty space, which is something that comes up quite a lot. Is that to reinforce a sense of loneliness, or is that? Oh well, you know, you 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 have the poems, and there's so much descriptive material, and then you try to. Oh my, I, I try to whatever imagine what can I use, what do I want to use, and somehow <coughs> somehow things happen. You know? mm. I don't know. You you start with the sky, and then I don't know. It happened that it became just this isolated landscape. I and mean, it's fascinating as well, you're talking about the fact that there is this kind of graveyard to statuary and there are actually decapitated figures essentially awaiting yeah. the that. I mean, the, the thing that occurred to me was that it's very similar to, to Chirico, who used a lot of Greek statuary yeah. and used them to kind of imply something or a kind of a place outside of reality. And is that something that you're consciously aware of, you're thinking about, this kind of sense that this is actually a real scene, but it also feels like metaphysical painting. Yeah. It feels like a vision or a dream or something yeah. very removed from reality. I think, I mean, dreams play a big role and I'm also fascinated by this, uh, yeah, like the, the surrealist mm. uh, manifest or something yeah. where, where it's like, you know. Um, so I think it does play a big role for me, but then Actually, working it out, I'm not thinking it yeah. all the way through. But certainly, the background as well, in the sense of it being in no place, you know, yeah. it's kind of. It's yeah, but it, I, I was finish. thinking about trees, and then it would be all disturbing. I wanted just him yeah. and. Uh, yeah. In fact, you can talk about his kimono as well, which, when you see it, is extraordinarily painted. It's beautiful, and this is. I thought this was some invention, but it's I your kimono. Invention. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't paint inventions. Um, <laughs> No, it's my kimono. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's uh, it has the story of of the Western people entering Japan for the first time with their tra with their yeah, uh, how do you say it? with their stuff to sell probably. Uh, oh yeah. Trade trade, trade goods. Or say, goods. Trade goods. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. So yeah. That's, so you have another that's story also in nice the that you connect nice. connect whatever let's call it a Asian mm. <laughs> that you have this. Poems, original poems. So we have, a, yeah, the set is similar thing. We have Marla working the classical yeah. tradition with Chinese poems, yeah. so two very different traditions. Together. And then you have Greek statuary and Japanese. We can put it just all in one pot, yes. But that's lovely. And maybe we can get back a little bit later to this idea of collaging not only images, but also collaging histories or stories thoughts. and bringing them yeah. together in thoughts. Um, yeah, should we do it to that? We'll move on. No, I was, I was thinking, <laughs> maybe it's stupid. Um, that I, I don't know, my, my paintings are also sometimes based on stories which other people tell me, but I'm, I'm very bad in my brain, everything starts flipping and then it becomes their own reality. So when I heard, when with Trump, these yeah. fake news started, I was like, shit, but I'm all fake news. <laughs> paintings is fake news. Painting is it's fake news. It's just my, yes. my truth or something. I make this weird truth which is probably not... So that's interesting. All, I mean, yeah. I, um, this idea of actually taking things from real life but combining them, or somehow you take control of them and then they become transmuted yeah. or transformed and they become something other than reality, but nonetheless pertaining to that, I think is interesting. In dreams, I always think, yeah, because I don't have much fantasy or something, yeah. so I need something where to start from, something somebody gives me or something I, I experience. Or, like when I when I paint a painting, everything what I do, what I eat, or what animals I come along, or something, they can play a role in the painting which I'm doing. And I think that's really interesting with respect to the next I image, if I've got the order right. Yeah. Which again, this is purely my interpretation, I should say. But when I saw it, it reminded me very much of Manet's Déjeuner Sauvage, which is a painting about you know if you have the bather in the background and then this kind of uh, group of people in the front and the bather in the background is being a painting and it's really about the relationship between the studio and reality and how you how those two things come together and it's very dreamlike it's neither authentically outside or yeah. authentically in the studio it's a kind of strange conglomeration of those things and that atmosphere feels very much present here it's both outside but it's posed and it feels like it's in the studio uh, and there are very many kind of formal elements that we call. We have the doubled female figure, one of whom is looking out towards us at the gaze, one of whom is looking away. We have this kind of amazing character who seems to be a painter and is adopting a similar form 
to the artist in, in Manet's painting. She's bathing, of course. So there are a bunch of things going on interesting here. But it's that really that idea of taking something from reality and then transforming it into something that feels dreamlike is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder if you could talk about who these two people are to start mm -hmm. with and how you came up with this kind of pastoral scene. You see, uh, also, maybe this time, because we, they're based on the poems, the works, there's kind of an explanation for everything. Or like, uh, yeah, you can read and I yeah. I I But mostly, I, because they're so personal, my works, I, I don't like to explain, overly explain mm -hmm. things, go too deep into it, because I think it gets uninteresting. <laughs> also, I also think it's then, it's more open if you don't tell too much, then everybody can see something. And that's important to me also that, we didn't talk about this, but um, I always think it's important. Uh, for me, art should be for all kinds of persons. So, okay, you're an art critic, you see all kinds of stuff. You see Dijonet, uh, and <laughs> But um, my neighbor, which is this guy, he doesn't know anything about art. And he's just, he's happy to see a naked woman. <laughs> since, yeah, he didn't see one since a while. So, um, so I think it's nice that I always tried, I mean, the style of painting which I have is probably understandable for, yeah. everybody can have like a little bit and then the more you know, the deeper you can dig. Like, but I think it's interesting that occupies, again, this kind of, liminal or open space in which, yeah, I will in yeah. inevitably come and interpret it yeah. art historically, but there are so many different ways of reading this, yeah. and I mean so many different atmospheres in it as well, and, you know, whether you read it as, even how you think of the scene, if it's idyllic or if it's threatening, you yeah. know, what's the relationship between these two people, I, I think it's interesting know. as well, yes. yeah, <laughs> but I think those are things that people can bring and yeah, yeah, yeah. into it, yeah. um, and I, yeah, to reiterate, the kind of art critic tendency. I, uh, I was asking you what, where the woodpecker came from. I am. Uh, and you told me. Yeah, he just visited me in the garden. <laughs> so and nobody believed me because I never saw a green one. And then he, I, when the painting was finished, I saw him and I <laughs> photographed him for you. But um, yeah, so I thought it's nice that you have. This is about youth. This painting. So and you have this bird which can just fly away. He just has a feather. I mean, I want another thing about it which I think is interesting in relation to the whole cycle of paintings, and that's this idea of doubling or this kind of split screen as yeah. well, which happens a few times where you have almost two halves or two sides, uh -huh. and this scroll which divides the painting between the reflected and or connect. the yeah. real or connect. Yeah. And perhaps you just tell us a little bit about what's on this this scroll that the <coughs> writer is writing on. Oh well, it's it's just a writing of of a book of. Gottfried Ben, mm -hmm. three old men it's called, and they're, they're telling all this wisdom to a young guy. They're discussing. I, th I thought they have such nice words for each other. I don't know. It's not really, it's just in connection with the old guy, I guess. But um, what, I, what I like, I mean, you don't see it so much now with the drawing and stuff, but mostly you see paintings on on, on the computer or on the, in a book or something, and it's so small that you that you don't see any details. And I think that's the what I like to give to the viewer, which makes the effort to see the painting mm -hmm. real. That you get something extra. That I have many times that there's like little things happening, which you discover just when you see them in reality. And was that part of the impulse of building that hexagonal space? Because it does take what is a very large space at St. Cole's, and actually makes it much closer. You're yeah. in this kind of theatrical space. Yeah. You're much closer to the paintings than you would be. There's much less space around you. It feels like, although there's no ceiling, it feels like it brings the height down. Is that the idea that you can bring people in and bring them close to the painting? Yes, but also, I don't know, it feels, it felt necessary. It's mm. hard to explain. Yeah. I also, there's carpet. I wanted them to feel good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want them to crawl and to lay and to picnic. But it's a comfortable space, that's interesting. And also, as we say, on the, there's quite a lush carpet, and on the carpet, as you walk in, uh, there are, there's a word <coughs> printed on the carpet in these kind of biomorphic letters with an exclamation mark beneath, which yeah. says, Hoch, yeah. which I just thought meant listen, 
exclamation mark, yeah. but actually has a slightly different. Yeah, it's just this horrich uh, with the like somebody with the with the hand like. So it's like listen closely yeah, or listen kind of closely. Lean, lean in. It's, uh, yeah. But it, may, it kind of accentuates that sense of going into a relatively private, enclosed space. So actually, yes. it's not just listen; it's listen quietly. Or kind yeah, of it's something more. It makes it personal, and it makes it. I yeah. don't know. And the carpet deadens the sound as well, so you don't have ah. people yeah. banging around. True. True. Yeah. <laughs> You're so thoughtful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. See how far we get. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Oh, well. And this is beauty. Yes, this beauty. And this leads maybe most closely to the poem itself and that the poem describes is it two women by a pond or is it man and woman by be, a pond? No, it's women by the pond and then the horsely, horsey man come or something. <laughs> but yeah, I took for the photograph, you know, I asked this very beautiful boy, but he was too weak for the girls. I also <laughs> I had to just leave him away. He's very little there. So he doesn't know yet, but he's not paid. But yeah, so... When are you going to tell him that he's, that he's been relegated to the edge? No, it comes. Yeah, <laughs> shit. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's something special about these girls. I, I'm always uh, touched when, when these girls have... Girls can have special moments together. I think men can. Well, this painting, perhaps, of, of all, certainly in this cycle, really doesn't come across in reproduction or at the side. Oh. Because what's extraordinary about it when you see it in the space is the colours, the fabric, the intensity of this blue and, and red actually, hmm. and this very central part which is beautifully painted actually. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I thought it was almost too sweet, but then I said, fuck it. I, it's good, yeah, it's sweet. Can, one, one sweet one, I'm allowed. Okay, one, <laughs> one sweet one. Um, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the relationship. You talked about the way that you paint in parts, and it's quite visible here in that you have this very broad kind of background here, and a paint at the edge, which is just big, big strokes, huge white area, and then in the corners and edges, you know, this kind of thin wash yeah. of water. But then in the centre, this very intense, very precisely painted section. So just in terms of how you approach the canvas yeah. and how you're working through it. Yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, for me it would be very difficult to paint just one style all over because as a person you also exist of so many different parts. So it's always nice to look forward to the next part or something. So I, it's almost as if you paint you paint the skin and stuff and when you just can't bear it anymore, then you, do, you yeah. know, you need to do big gestures. And then you do that, and then you can go back to the nice, uh, uh, to the clothes or something. Yeah. So, and everything with the same intensity, but a different. Yeah. So it balances out, and it, I don't know, this way I can stay like. Yeah. <laughs> and are you thinking when you're preparing the paintings, even in your mind, you're thinking this is an opportunity to paint fabrics, to paint textiles? Yes, is that of something course. you want? Kind of, you're thinking this is yeah. what I'm going to do Sometimes, you know, I also tell the models, like, I would like. If you bring clothes to take, or if I give clothes, I, I think of course about, mm. God, this is, will take me a week. <laughs> I'm, let's not do that, you know. But um, yeah, of course, and you look forward to paint, paint it. You don't start at a big size canvas like this for, if you don't feel like it. I mean, yeah. so you have to create yourself moments where you know yeah. which you're going to be looking for. Yeah. Uh, uh, happy. Yeah. Happy to be, you know, how to say. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, excited to paint yeah, it, or excited. yeah, looking forward so to it. So it's always, yeah, you, yeah. you have to stay excited. How, how quickly do you paint? We didn't talk about that. How long does the camera take? Oh, well. Does it depend? Yeah, I work from morning till night, so uh -huh. I think this painting maybe like three weeks or something. And do you work one painting at a time, or do you yes, go back to them? Yes, it's always, I just can concentrate just on Just one, one and thing. then finish, really? Yes. And you never return to them? Mostly not. Really? Yeah. yeah. And perhaps we can just, because I think we talked about how it was too sweet, but I'm intrigued by this little salamander. Yeah, I don't know, it just needed it. Yeah, yeah, it needed, it needed some, some character, I don't know, I needed a... He's like, I also like, found he's like a voyeur, do you know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> and a dangerous salamander, dangerous, yeah. 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 No. Okay, great. Well, can we move on to that? Oh, so these are the... <laughs> the drunks in spring, Should is that right? Should we change it? Are we going to get a quick neck? <laughs> uh, these are the drunks in spring, and again, this is as you know, the first one in the cycle is. It's very much 
you know, taking Mahler, taking these poems, and reimagining them in the context of contemporary Antwerp and amongst your circle of friends and acquaintances. Yeah. So this is your husband down here, yes. lying, and then this is his band, is that right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, what to say? I, I thought it's, uh, we had, I had to paint them, and I thought it's fitting, because they're always hanging out drunk in the cellar. Play. So I think it, I thought it was fitting to the subject. And you often paint musicians, I mean, is that, or people with musical instruments, yeah. or kind of engaged in something, is that? Um, yeah, he's a musician, so we have lots of, we had a music studio in the, in the cellar, yeah. in the garage, so they pass lots of music. In Antwerp, music and art is very much in each other, or at least in the group where I mm. used to. And again, putting my art critics hat on, <laughs> this leg here, so we can see the twisted leg beneath the keyboard player, reminding me very much of Otto Dix's famous work, The Card Players, which presents three war veterans playing in a small table. Yeah. They all have prosthetics or mechanical arms or you know, wooden legs, and the wooden legs beneath the table are all at odd angles and they yeah. kind of merge with the chairs. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about Otto Dix and, and perhaps Gross as inspirations for you, or to people that you look towards, that kind of new objectivity school, and what attracts you to it, or if you're attracted by it. Yeah, I, w I was very much attracted as a, as a young person, or in, I come from Düsseldorf, so he stayed, Otto Dix stayed a long time in Düsseldorf, there's a street, I mean there, there was this Mutter Ei, which was a uh, mecenas for him, okay. how do you call, is it mecenas? Some person who supports the arts. A oh, patron. Patron. And there's, yeah, he's very much connected to the city and there's in the museums uh, yeah. pieces of him, so. I, don't, I liked his realism mm -hmm. and the way he, he always made something very sad, very funny looking. Yeah. I think it's a good way to make it more easy to... It's interesting, his kind of grotesquery is yeah. very, it's much harder, it's very satirical, it's very kind of... It's quite a negative view of yeah. people or individuals. I mean, that's to be. probably also the time, timing. Well, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering about taking that sense of absurdity or the grotesque, but actually, you kind of celebrate that idea. I mean, these characters are, you know, it's a similar scene. They're kind of drunken, you know, they're, but they're actually very. It's very celebratory of that idea of musicianship, of creativity, um, and it's interesting that you take that style and move it into this kind of celebratory way of thinking about the way that people behave. Does that make sense? Yes, but kind of it politics. makes me sad almost because maybe I make it beautiful because I want it to be cute. <laughs> I, I also like I like these disgusting things. Also on people, if you have like, uh, you know, these... Uh, Barracus yeah, things. Yeah, those ones. And if they come out, it's something ugly maybe, but it's, yeah. I know it's fun to paint. And I, I don't see one here. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I think I mean, even you know, in the shading of flesh, which is something that would normally look, I mean, these kind of colours on the legs here, yeah. which might kind of imply illness, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But they're beautiful and they're strange. Yeah. And kind of using blues or kind of brown ochre tones for flesh tones yeah. implies disease. But it doesn't, it comes across as very exciting somehow, I think, if that makes sense. Yes, but I think it's. it's I mean. I have another phrase at the top here. Yes. Clairement zeal of fall which means the throat and the soul are full. Yes, right? but you can also, I don't know if you have these expressions, you can read it so many different ways mm. somehow, to have the kale fall, it could be from drinking, could be from life itself I or see, something. Yeah, yeah. So I like also, like this word bingo comes a lot, or I like these words which are very open also. Mm. To, to meaning where you can say, oh, yeah, it could be this way, it could be that way. Yeah. And I never almost use words which are just that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, perhaps talking about bingo, we can move on to the final work, in which we can see, I don't know if everyone can see it here, but written or inscribed onto this uh, dead tree trunk at the bottom is the word bingo. And it's actually realized and kind of, well, I don't know, how you st it's stuck onto the canvas. Ah, no, it? yeah, it's is like it? a. The silicon machine. And ah, okay. Yes. So we have bingo here, which relates back to the word bingo, which is in the third painting. Yes, yes. Uh, and then again, we have this split, which I'm interested by, yeah. and this kind of narrative. So this is the final song in the cycle. Yes. It's a very sad song. It's about death, really. It's about a move towards the yes. end. Um, and perhaps you could just tell us about how you get 
because this was the first one in the cycle you painted. Yes. True. So perhaps how you found this figure and how you arrived at this scene in which to, to put her. Oh, well, um, yeah, she's actually a ballet dancer from Antwerp. And I met her for a different project, which I did for the <coughs> opera. And that's probably why I started this painting first, because I had her picture first. And then I thought, wow, this would be the perfect figure for my wood, yeah. uh, in the woods painting. So, yeah, I took her and then never really painted trees, so this took me a long time to paint it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, all the, all the trees are somehow also familiar, almost also like friends, because I, I used to go running in the parks in Antwerp, and especially this tree on the right is a beech, beech tree, uh -huh. blood beech tree. And I, it's stupid, esoteric. I always ran to it, I had hard times. I took the water in the roots and like, oh, <laughs> even on my baby, I put it on my hands. So, so I, I thought he, he needs a space on the... Well, this tree definitely has a personality as well. And yeah. the attention given to him. I don't know why I'm saying to him, but... To yeah, him. you think he's a he? Yes, yeah, maybe, somehow, yeah. I don't know why. <coughs> but he definitely dicks just... coming up, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like also, you know, with the salamander, everything has its personality, I think. Oh, for me, it's for me it's exciting to if you paint an object or if you paint the clothes that you you try to see behind it or mm. you try to treat it. Oh God, it sounds it's this laugh or something. No, but it also relates to dreams. I think the idea that Maybe. in dreams there's this idea of things, inanimate objects, becoming alive or possessed of something. Is it just in dreams? Um, or maybe it's when you're really drunk or high. I don't know. There's Maybe it's like just now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but these yeah, states you can enter into where yeah. things, there's not quite the simple division between what is real or what is unreal or what is living and what, it, what isn't. And I certainly feel that. Yeah, you discover things painting. by painting also. No, if you, you let it happen and then you, you probably you end up with a whole different result than you imagined it. Yeah. And that's also nice to be surprised. And How do you mean you, you start and it ends up different just in the process <coughs> of making? Maybe you can just take us through your Like a tree, you paint a tree and it tells you stuff, I need this and this. Yeah. And then, okay, you do it. Yeah. Or like the tree ch uh, the chair, the tr uh, chair leg. Like. Mm -hmm. The painting needs more, like, so it tells you it tells you what you have to do yeah. a little bit. No, and you have to just do it. But that's it, even when the way you talk about it there, you're kind also, of giving the materials. Yeah. Kind of degree of agency as well, which is nice. It's also with things I like to I like to add things sometimes to paintings, like a cup holder with a whatever with a beer in uh -huh. or uh, yeah, a lamp or something. Sometimes things stick out or the canvas falls down like a blanket. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. I think obviously you have to listen a bit. What what does he want or she whatever? Yeah. What does it want? And then you have to do it. Yeah. You're just. Uh, so, I mean, that's interesting in terms of the way this composition is put together, because where the other mm. ones were actually staged or were scenes, this yeah. one is more is separate this parts one, yeah. that are put together. So, yeah. you had the original that's photograph That's why it's also more difficult, maybe, to... Yeah. So, where you had the photograph of the ballet dancer, then yes. you had your... And you took photographs of the tree. Is At that daylight, right? yeah. And then this central section is imagined or kind of fantastic? Or yeah, it's also see? trees which I photographed, but yeah, and then imagined. And then you have a little Iggy Pop <laughs> over the shoulder, where she's yeah, looking back to fiery. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, some things come because, like the like the grass which grows. Uh -huh. It's very beautifully set in the poem, and then you try to achieve it how it sounds yeah. to make it look like yeah. how it sounds. And we should say as well. So this comes at the end of the the cycle of these six works organized exactly. So the fact that this woman is looking both backwards and forwards actually yes. brings a nice kind of circularity yeah, to the entire work. So you feel like you're moving yeah. around it. Um, and you're going to have, this is the song from the song cycle that will be performed yes. at St. Nicole's on the 19th. Bring a handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Great. Well, should we move beyond the yeah, cycle? Sure. Keep going. I uh, this is, and this is the home. So, in your press release for the show, you talk a little bit about the Heimlich Maneuver yeah. as an idea for artistic practice. Perhaps you could just expand on that a little bit. Mm, yeah, I thought, because of all this bullshit around, we, we, need, we need art to do the, I don't know if you know the Heimlich Maneuver, it's to get rid of something where you're, where you're, where you're um, 
die yeah. talking from. So I think art functions almost like a like a anti, like the uh, to get the stuff out. <laughs> that's that's the idea behind it. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. So and there's a work. So we actually well actually, let's talk about the Baby Detective Club, which will explain these two figures yes. here. So actually, if anyone was being particularly uh, observant, they'll have noticed in the very first painting we looked at, there was a character on the very right hand edge with his magnifying glass, which yeah. is a kind of motif that comes up quite a lot in your paintings, yeah. and goes back to this idea of the Baby Detective Club, which yeah. emerged kind of in collaboration with your friend a while no, ago. Well, I had the idea about it. I thought it's somehow necessary to, to come together more to discuss things, to discuss whatever problems we we think are necessarily mm. to discuss and to work on. <coughs> so I started this baby detective club in 2012 and I wrote, I, I don't know, maybe 100 people a hand-typed letter with this <coughs> invitation to join the club and with a manif manifest, I will have it later. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's also kind of like the Heimlich maneuver, just to, you yeah. know. And so the club exists in reality, but it also exists like in, in my work's reality, and it also exists maybe in some other reality. Yeah. So it's very, very complicated also to explain. Anyway, so we made a movie <coughs> in 2012, the first, first part of a movie, three pieces, of the baby detective. And she, Julia, she plays the baby detective and I'm her alter ego, I'm the, I'm the S, the it, how you call it, the, the in the it, brain. It, if yeah. you have the ich, it. über ich, yeah. s. It, 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 yeah, it, she's yeah. more like that. She helps the other. So, so that, <laughs> I mentioned this before, but it, that's id, ego, and super ego, it's Freud, right? Yes, yes. And then you have Heimlich, which is, Freud talked about the unheimlich. Ah, yeah, yeah. So it's in the, oh, my God. Cast ah, yeah. anyway. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll keep that for next day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yes. So. Um, and there was a nice thing yeah. you said to me earlier about the Baby Detective Club, which is this, and it's in the manifesto a little bit, or kind of touched upon, that it's premised on this idea of looking at things afresh, or actually. Yeah, it's not about babies, of course. It's not about babies. <laughs> but it's about looking at things as if, you know, without prejudice, essentially, yes. or being able to look at things afresh. And actually, just, you know, reading about Mahler and that. Um, that song cycle, he wrote that after grief it was fascinating, or he wanted to find a way of looking at the world anew, he wanted to look freshly at the world, yep. like a newborn baby. And so it's interesting these things tie in, that these ways of thinking fresh or thinking anew, yeah. that kind of, I suppose, drives a lot of your work, the idea of how do you see things again without prejudice or again, or see them it's anew. It's hard also to do, no? You have yeah. to force yourself always to do that. Or if you experience something very terrible, I, I recognize you turn into this stone which doesn't have anything. And then to turn from stone again to a sponge, very difficult action. Yeah. And so this yeah. is a, what, is this a stone being expunged here actually? It's certainly oh, something well, hard. No, it's actually something very soft. Oh, is it? Yes, is it's it? a cotton cotton thing to clean your face. Ah, I painted okay. it black. Yes. Okay. But I well, thought, I, I don't know, I found it, I thought it's fitting. Because it can swell. Oh, because it expands. <coughs> expands, yes. Um, so this is, I mean, we're talking about dreams, and this is another word which closely relates the idea of dreams, and it seems most, the most explicitly dreamlike of all the works. And yeah. The, the characters seem to be having this kind of opium dream of a magician. And, but I wanted to talk particularly about the way that the canvas isn't fixed or isn't trimmed here, and yeah. why you decided to have these aspects of elements coming out beyond the frame. How, why do you decide? I don't know. It always just you think ah, this would this would be exciting to have that almost like a um, curtain, yeah. like a curtain and hanging almost sculpturally. Yeah. But it becomes a mixture between yeah, it's a combination between sculpture and and painting because painting itself sometimes it bores you that it's such a flat thing. So mm. you try to make stuff on it. And I mean it's interesting, this is a kind of classic 
talk question, but you do make sculptures as well, and what's the relationship? Do you think that you think of this as a painting rather than sculpture, or do you not like to make that distinction? Oh, well, I, I didn't think about it, but if it can be art. It can be art, okay. <laughs> but when you're making sculptures, what does that, and I think if you're more conventional sculptures, mm. like the one that will hold the video at Sadie Cole's, what is it that attracts you to making sculptures that you aren't able to do as a painter? Why do you some is there something you can do as a sculptor that you can't as a painter? Is it something about the process? Is it a relief? Well, it's different things. As a painter, you're, you're all alone in your studio, and if you do a video or a sculpture, I, I need people and I can hang out with my friends. <laughs> you, know? and you can have some social contact, which is important also to make. It's important also to. Yeah, to give it a new schwung, uh, to yeah, you know, yeah. like a good energy. Yeah. So sometimes to balance out the loneliness, you, I like it's maybe also yeah. in the sculpture. But then also, I think they're very close connected to the paintings. But some, some, every every idea needs a new approach, and then you can see, ah, yeah, it has to be a painting. This idea it has to be whatever a sausage. And just having a circle of friends and kind of, you know, not necessarily collaborators, you have is it Julia who works with you, but does having that circle of friends, is that important to you as an artist? It seems to be they're very much represented in your works, but even having ideas and being able to see other people's work, see music, is that something you're conscious of as yes, being necessary to your process? It's necessary from time to time, maybe, yeah, it's necessary. I mean, I think as well, I also, I always, I, I need, I could do just self-portraits, which I do a lot, yeah. but it's also... But you couldn't just retreat into your studio and work without that kind of... I did that for a year now, but <laughs> um, yeah, from time to time you need people, and I certainly, I need the people around me yeah. to, to have models, so yeah. I do need people. You need models. Yeah, <laughs> yeah otherwise, yeah. I was in, well, it's interesting because I was thinking about, you know, the in a way, although it's incidental to your, the way you're painting them, I suppose, but they, the paintings do serve as documents of this kind of Antwerp scene as well, and it's quite interesting to see them, for me, in that respect, because I can see what Antwerp looks like, or yeah, I can see the kind of community of people who are making art and performing and making music, and you see the bars, and it's nice. It might be slightly incidental to what you're doing, but it certainly serves as a document of a time, of a Maybe, place. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Interesting. As you're talking about dicks, you know, making a document of the time and the place, and you can pick people out as models or kind of inspirations for specific people. Yours works to do that as well. I think what's also the point, you know, as an artist, we have the luxury we don't need to hang out with assholes. So if I paint <laughs> people, I want them to be nice people. I don't want to paint somebody which I don't, you know, which yeah. knows an asshole. I don't yeah. want to spend two weeks painting. Okay. So. Don't work on portrait commissions. No. You'll never get a no. job. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, we, so yeah, <laughs> this one. So this is a this is a bit older. Um, perhaps you could talk about this just in terms of its. Uh, it seems almost like a precursor to some of the works that are in the current show, mm -hmm. and maybe just as yeah, a work at this stage in your practice, where it came from. It's kind of extraordinary how you set up this scene, what's happening, who the bear is. I don't know who the bear is. Um, he returns in a sculpture later as a musician, as a guitar player. Okay. But. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wanted. I, I don't know. I wanted this almost guru-like figure, and there's, there's sometimes you know you don't know everything about the painting. But this relates. It's a very good painting, this, but because I, I even don't know. But it certainly suggests to me, in the same way we talked about dreams, and then you know, two images ago we had a dream in which there was a magician conjured. Yeah. And this, I mean, this guy kind of, it, to me, it comes as a kind of shamanic scene. Yes. You know, you're around a fire, yeah. this guy's telling a story, or he's yeah. creating some kind of narrative. Yeah. These people are wrapped. There's a Pegasus coming, flying. There's a horse. pig. Yeah, there's a horse flying down. Oh, and there's a, like a, how do you call it? The, which counts time. Our glass and it's propped closed. I don't know. I, I just see it again, so I just see it. And there's an actual horseshoe attached to the painting. Oh, I see in the same yeah. yeah. <coughs> but this idea of this guy conjuring scenes or conjuring narratives or conjuring images 
seems in some ways related. I'm interested in this idea in your work that actually the artist is the person who conjures narratives or creates dreams or creates images. Yeah. And there do seem to recur these kind of figures who are either conjuring dreams or images or kind of experiencing them. But you know, it's maybe the longing for... Sometimes it would be so easy if you could just lean back and somebody explains it, everything to you. And <laughs> why and, you know, and how and how are we going to move forward. Something like that. So this guy is a kind of, out, of course. he's a kind of, yeah, <laughs> so he's a kind of guru figure in this, explaining. Maybe, yeah, yes. Yeah. Should we go? How are we doing for time, by the way? We've got a lot. No, 2.50. Oh, it's 2.50? Oh, we should take questions. Should we, questions. Should we race through? I don't know, I don't care, I don't know. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> we could just. Uh, should we take questions? Would you want to? It's, it's, it's something to drink from. I know what it is. <laughs> Maybe Just, because we've got it up. Can you show the next picture as well? That's great. It's funny, I made the self portrait and people have to actually kind of give me a kiss. It's very uncomfortable to see other people. It's drink. really uncomfortable, right? Yes, I went. Um, isn't, it, what's it, isn't it called Spit Fountain or something? What's it's it? kind of a, a spook, schluck, yes. Yeah, spit swallow fountain. <laughs> and where for is out it? of me for you. That's very generous of you. Yes. So you're just spitting on people. You know, in Antwerp you don't get a free glass of water in the bar. I hate that. So you have to really I wanted, it. Yes, I wanted the people to have free water in the city, so that's why I did it. Please, they have to kiss you. Yes, yeah. they have to go through that. No part, but then they can do it ice cross. Um, well, we've got most ice cover. Should we leave it there? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Like this guy again. Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, I'm totally overrun. Um, do you have any questions? Good one. Yeah, then. <laughs> so you talked about um, Oxford Dix and Gross. Um, are, are there any um, sort of contemporary artists that excite you particularly? Who excite me? Uh, many, probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, who do you choose? I don't know. I, I experienced a lot of Jonathan Mese lately. I really like him. And uh, Jordan Wolfson. It can be all kinds of people, everything. I mean, difficult. I don't have a hero or something yeah. anymore. I like Baselitz a lot, but then, yeah. Yeah, he's really. really it's a typical question. Did you have art school heroes? heroes? What? Did you have art school heroes when you were at school? <laughs> Did you have anyone at school who was a hero? You know, a hero. I was a big Basquiat fan. Mm. But. Um, when, when, when I was studying in Antwerp, I had a very good teacher. He didn't say anything, he just said good, <laughs> which I liked, of course. But uh, you could meet him in the cafe, and there, there he told just the greatest stories. And that was, that's why he was my hero, Fred Berfutz. He's a very good painter. He paints with pure acid, with his fingers. And um, yeah, he told stories about uh, in a golden suit in the desert in the States, throwing grenades at fishes, whatever. That's what I like this romantic side of, of, of being an artist and I like to keep it up some, somehow for me. So I don't, you know, you would never see an iPhone in my paintings or something yeah. because it, ah, it's ugly. <laughs> Didn't have a telephone for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, no, yes. Is that an answer? Yeah, I think so. Did you go to art school in Antwerp? Mm -hmm. Which is I don't know if it's a good choice, but for me it worked out well because it's very traditional and lots of um, naked people painting, <laughs> three years long, still lives. Just yeah. Then I went to the models, not the painters. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then we, I went to Vienna for for half a year, I think, which was very very exciting because there was more competition and it's a very I experienced as a very free town and I met the people of Gelatine, the artists, and yeah, that was very exciting. Totally different, but then I had to return. I was happy. Yes? Um, I noticed that you signed some of your work um, with the KH, and like, why do you do that? Um, because obviously lots of people don't do it so much anymore, uh -huh. and it's like quite interesting. If you think about that, like maybe like with the thing of rotation in your work, or like the different bits from like like eighty pop or whatever, like how that you know, like I don't know, it seems quite interesting that like in the context of say altarpieces or whatever that you choose to do that. Hmm. 
mean, with the signing, you mean? Yeah, like the stamp. Ah, stamp. Like the... You know, it's almost like you, you or the, the use of words or something, you, you try to find a composition. I don't know, I always signed my work since I'm 16, probably with this stupid crown. I continue <laughs> doing it. I don't know, like to be a princess or something. <laughs> um, yes, I, yeah, it just worked out for me as a as a compos composition thing somehow. It also feels good to do the circle and a chuck and finish, gone. <laughs> <laughs> Is that everyone? I think, should we leave it there? I'm roasting hot. Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Kati, and thanks for Thank saying. you too.